Good morning. We'll go ahead and begin this morning. I hate to break up all the fellowship. So thankful that each and every one of you are here on this beautiful Sunday morning to worship our Lord as we're commanded to do. We're so thankful for you and your presence. If you're visiting with us, we're thankful for your presence. And we want to invite you back here at Midway and any opportunity that you may have. Stick around. Let us get to know you. Shake your hand. Uh, please plan on attending our Bible class after the closing prayer this uh, at, at the end of our service. Um, if you didn't have an opportunity to pick up a bulletin this morning, they're in the back. Uh, you can step out and grab one. We have sermon notes, and you can keep up with the, the different events that are going on here at Midway and in our community. Uh, if you did not have an opportunity to pick up um, a Lord's Supper packet, uh, these young men right here will walk down the, the center aisle, raise your hand up high so that we can see you, and we'll, they'll get that to you right now. So if you did not have that opportunity... Uh, I have one announcement that I need to make to begin. Uh, Ann Alma wrote, uh, she's been very sick. She's in UAB Hospital, and uh, she has been given, given a limited time um, left. Uh, so they're asking for our prayers. So please remember that family uh, in your prayers, if you can. Um, the order of our worship this morning, Kelly Sims will lead us in her congregational singing. Our opening prayer by Brother Ben Lawler. Uh, Mark Howell will bring us the lesson of the hour, and Mike Wolf will direct us in the Lord's Supper at the appropriate time. And in our close of our service, Brother Ronnie Brown will close us in our service. We'll enter into our worship now. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our most mighty Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you've permitted us to see another day of life. Father, we're thankful that you are our God and you are our Creator. Father, we acknowledge that you are in control of all things, whether on this earth or in heaven. Father, we pray that we will live our lives daily in a way which will be subjective unto you. Father, we're thankful for this nation in which we live in. We're thankful for the bountiful resources that's here to sustain our lives. Father, we're thankful for the ones who have gone on before who set forth the statutes in which we live. Father, we're thankful that we live in a nation which was created upon your principles and your word. Father, we're sorrowful at this time, though, because our nation has turned from those words. Father, we live in a nation which parades around evil and subjects good to criticism. Father, we pray that our nation will return to the founding principles upon which it was created. Father, we pray that we will once again be a nation which serves you and glorifies you. Father, we're mindful of the ones who are enduring the trials of life at this time. We're mindful of Carmen Sparks Ann Amorose, Mark Randolph, Sheila Guthrie, Gary Compton. Father, you know each of their needs. Father, we're mindful of the ones who are unknown at this time who are suffering. We pray that your richest blessings will be upon them. Father, we're mindful of the ones who have lost loved ones. Father, we pray that you will comfort them today and the days to come. Father, we pray that you these people, their families will fill their hearts with you when the loneliness sets in. Father, 
We're mindful of the ones who have lost, who have left the fold. Father, we pray that their hearts will be pricked and they will return before it's everlasting too late. Father, we're mindful of the ones who are in prisons, who are in mental institutions. Father, we pray that they will realize that you are their God, that you are to be served. Father, we're mindful of the church here that meets at Midway. Father, we pray that we will continue to glorify you and to praise you in all things. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen.
Good morning this morning. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Thankful that you have chosen to be with us here at Midway this morning. We always want you to feel welcome here. If you're a guest with us, we want you to know that you are indeed welcome, and we invite you to be here at any opportunity that you might have. Most of us remember a man by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, we read an an entire book that bears his name in the Old Testament. But I want you to think about a particular time in the life of Jeremiah when God tells Jeremiah, I want you to go hunting. Now, he doesn't tell Jeremiah, I want you to go hunting for deer, rabbit, or squirrel, or anything like that. He tells Jeremiah, I want you to go hunting for a man, as you can see on the screen. I want you to see if you can find a man. Now, he's going to tell him what kind of man that he wants wants him to find. And it's going to be important because if he can find one of these men, he says, I'm going to make sure that I will take care of my children, my people. I will save their their nation, their land. Well, as we think about that, it's not my intent this morning to talk about the man that Jeremiah was to find. But I want you to pretend with me, if you will, this morning, that God came to us, one of us, each of us, and says to us, I want you to go out into the highways and the byways of Walker County, and I want you to find a man or a woman. And as we think about that this morning, the particular kind that God wants us to find is a man or a woman who is living a life of power. A man or a woman who is living a life of power. Now you take God at His Word, you are eager to get out and go do what God tells you to do, and so you head out the back door, and I would simply ask, what kind of person are you going to find? Who is it that you're looking for? What are the qualifications of a person who is living a life of power? Do you even know what you'd be looking for if you went out to find a person who is living a life of power? You know what? Many use a certain set of standards to identify a person living a life of power. They have it pictured in their mind what this person might look like. They think in their own mind how they would perceive a person, a man or a woman, who is living a life of power. Now some of those standards would include material wealth. You know, have they done well in this life? Have they been able to to get a little bit of this world's goods or stack them up? You know, have have these things that are tucked away so that uh, they 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 look uh, wealthy? Uh, do we look at the kind of house they live in? Do we look at the kind of car they drive? Do we look at the kind of vacation they take to see where they go and how much they spend on things of that nature? Uh, do we sometimes think about a person who is living a life of power when it comes to things such as social status. Now by that we would talk about a person maybe who is famous or a person who is popular. And if that person is famous or popular, surely they must be living a life of power. And these people, you know, when we, when we look at these people who have social status, uh, we think about how many followers they might have. Now a lot of times, unfortunately, in our day and time, when we think about followers, we think about followers on social media. And and we think, you know, that if a person has a whole bunch of followers, then they have a whole bunch of influence. And and, and really and truly, they do have a great extent of influence. But even if they had every single person in the world following them on social media, would they really be a person of power, living a life of of power. Another one of those standards that sometimes we might use is physical appearance. Are they elegant and attractive or are they plain and unappealing? Or maybe we would even say appalling. And when we think about that, you know, we equate beauty, we equate good looks with people who have power, don't we? And we do that probably because we look at Hollywood standards and If a person's not very good looking, he doesn't make it very much in the movies or a lady or woman. But if they have good looks, man, they can be a star, a megastar even. Do we look for people like that when we're looking for a person living a life of power? What about career achievements? Where do they work? How high up in the company are they? You know, do they have, uh, are they a boss or... Or are they someone, you know, who who gives directions to all the employees? Are we looking for that? What about personality? 
Are we looking for someone who's living a life of power who has that type A personality as compared to the type B? You know, the one who has the type A is, is aggressive. We, we look to see how aggressive they may be. And, and maybe even ruthless in the things that they would do. Showing their power to other people. If God told you, like He told Jeremiah, to leave the building, go out into the streets of Walker County, and find me a person living a life of power. Would you be looking for that kind of person? Now I'm going to tell you this morning, a person may have every single one of those characteristics. Every one of them. And still not be a person of power. If that is the case, why then do we as Christians teach our children that's what it takes to make it in this world? Why do we live a life imitating those things? Thinking that if I attain more of these things, I'm going to be a person of power. Why do we do that? I don't know why, except for this. We have begun to think like the world. We haven't let our mind be transformed to think like Christ. And as a result of that, we think like the world. If God told us to go out into the streets of Walker County and find a person living a life of power, what kind of person would God want us to find who is living, who He would define as living a life of power? Let's look at a, look at a couple of things this morning. Let's begin with this idea. If I want to live a life of power, I have to be associated with the one who has all power, who possesses all power. You know, sometimes when we talk about God, we refer to Him as being omnipotent. If we were to define the word omnipotent, as Cambridge uh, Dictionary defines it, it, they say that it is a person having unlimited power and able to do anything. Is God possess, does God possess unlimited power? Is God able to do anything he is therefore omnipotent. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 11 at verse number 7, one of Job's associates, a man by the name of Zophar, he raises a good question in uh, Job chapter 11, verse number 7. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? And of course, the answer to that is no. And when God and Job finally have a conversation, Job is convinced of that pretty much that quick because God fires off a, a list of questions that Job has no clue how to answer. God has unlimited power. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 28. Have you not known, have you not heard... The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And so, pretty much like Zophar said, you can't find the limits of God. You can't even begin to hunt down how much power, how much knowledge, how much God really is. We have finite minds. We have fixed. We, we think we're smart. And in reality, when we compare ourselves to, to the earth, we, you know, people on the earth, we, we do have smart. There are smart people who are smart in books, and there are smart people who are smart in common sense. And sometimes the common sense folks far outweigh, or should, you know, what the book learning folks know. But none of us Matter of fact, all of us put together don't even begin to compare with God. 
You see, when we think about God, God has complete control over His creation. Complete control over the earth, complete control over the things that are in the earth, complete control over space, the planets, the stars, the sun, all of those things that are out there. God has complete control over His universe. Now, why does He have complete control over His universe? He's omnipotent. He has all power. All power resides in Him. He spoke the universe into existence, and according to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 at verse number 3, He upholds it by the Word, by His Word. He keeps it going by His Word. He commanded it, and therefore it is there. Now, if God possesses all the power there is to possess, that's a part of being omnipotent. He has all the power that there is to possess. How could I ever expect to live a life of power without being connected to God? If God has all the power, how can I live a life of power if I'm not connected to the one who has all power? Does that make sense? I've got to have some kind of connection with Him. You know, this past week, there were several trees that were blown down along the highway. You may have noticed them. And when those trees were blown down, I'm sure some of them must have fallen on power lines because the power went off. The electricity. The juice, you know, in the house. Didn't have any juice in the house, as it were. Now why? Why was it? Well, some, something broke the connection with the generating of the power. As we think about that, can I have a life of power if I'm not connected? When I think about God and His power, if I want to live a life of power, I must recognize God's power. I have to recognize His power. I must realize that if I want true power, I have to go to Him to receive it. I have to recognize His power. There are various kinds of power that are available to us today, aren't there? Uh, we have steam power, where steam generates electricity and things like that. In days gone by, steam would run a locomotive, carry it down the track. We have uh, today atomic or nuclear power. You know, back in the 40s, there was an atomic explosion. Two of them, matter of fact, that pretty much served to end World War II. And today, when we think about atomic power, nuclear power, we have nuclear warheads. Sometimes these things are a deterrent from someone attacking another country or so forth. But that nuclear power also serves to help us sometimes even in our daily life by, again, generating electricity and things of that nature. Not only do we have those kinds of power, but also we have uh, uh, just, just different things that, that are powerful in our world. But none of these things can power a single thing in my life unless I'm connected with them. And I have to be connected with God. I recognize His power and I must become connected to Him. How do I become connected to God? Good question, isn't it? How do I become connected to God? Well, I want you to think about this. If I want to be connected to God, one of the best places would be to be in God, would it not? And when I look at passages such as the ones found in the book of Romans, chapter 6 at verse number 3, which tells me that when I'm baptized, I'm baptized into Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 at verse number 27, which basically says the same thing. If I'm baptized into Him and if I'm within His confines, am I not connected to Him? Absolutely. And so I need to be baptized into Him, to put Him on, to have Him in my life. Most of the people who are here this morning, 
have done that at some point in their life. There are some here probably who have not. You need to be connected to God if you want to have a life of power. And so I'm asking you this morning, what's hindering you from being connected to God in that way? Why would you not want to put your Lord on? By believing that He is the Son of God. By repenting of the sins that you have in your life. By making confession of the fact that you believe that He is the Son of God. You can be immersed into Him and thus make the connection with Him. Would today not be the day that you would want to make the connection so that you can begin to live A life of power. But here's something else that I would point out. And that is this. It's found in the book of Colossians chapter 2 at verse number 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. You know, when we connect this passage with one, say in 1 John chapter number 1, we understand that we as Christians if we want to continue to be connected with God, have to continue to walk in Him. We have to continue, John would say it this way in 1 John chapter 1, walk in the light. Now if you remember what John says in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light, what do we do? We have connection with God. He doesn't use the word connection there, does he? He uses a different word, but we would understand it to apply in the same way. We have fellowship with God. Maybe you're here this morning and in the past you become a Christian. You put the Lord on in baptism. The question for you is this, are you still connected with Him? Has something separated you from God? You know what? The only thing that can separate us from God is our sin. Are you living with sin in your life that needs to be corrected in some way or another? You see, if I want to if I want to live a life of power, I have to be connected, I have to recognize God's power, but I have to be connected to Him in order to have that. But not only that, I have to acknowledge that the same power that was able to raise Jesus from the dead is available for me even today. I have to, I have to recognize and acknowledge the fact that it is theirs. You know, sometimes I think when we look at the Bible, uh, when we start in Genesis chapter 1 and we see God speaking the universe into existence, we say, how amazing was that? God had the power to do that. We move forward in time. And we see things like the parting of the Red Sea so that the children of Israel could come across on dry land. And we say, what power God possessed back then. When He caused the walls of Jericho to fall down flat. And on and on and on we could go. When He guided the rock that was in the sling that David slung into the forehead of Goliath and struck the giant down. We say, what power? When we come into the New Testament and we see Jesus as He walks on the water, or we see Jesus as He walks by a funeral procession and He sees a mother crying because her only son, she's a widow, her only son has died, and Jesus walks up and gets the man out of the coffin. That's power. And when we see Jesus hanging on the cross and the sun refusing to shine at noontime and Him being taken down from that cross dead and placed into a grave and on the next Sunday morning He's outside that grave talking. That is power. 
I picture in my mind all of the power that God has. I can see it illustrated time after time after time after time. And I believe those things. Do you? Do you believe all of those things that the power of God was able to accomplish in biblical times? Do you? Most people are sitting there saying, well, yes, I do. But you know what? I've got to believe that that power is available to help me. Now, I'm not suggesting this morning that God is going to miraculously work in our life. Matter of fact, He made it clear back in the book of 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, in Ephesians chapter number 4, that He wouldn't work in that way. After a certain time, when the apostles all died, the power that had been given to them would eventually cease. I'm not suggesting that God is going to somehow work a miracle in our life. But what I am saying is that God's power is there for me when I'm confronted with the hazards and the hard times of life. It is there for me. I want you to think about a passage of Scripture with me this morning. You might even want to turn to it in your Bible. Matthew chapter 17 at verse number 20. Matthew chapter 17, verse number 20. Here's what the passage says. It says, He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. As I look at this passage of Scripture, I, I, I know that Jesus was talking to the apostles. He was talking to them in the age of the miraculous. And again, we know that the apostles themselves taught us, as I've already quoted this morning, that the age of the miraculous would cease. And sometimes I think we read this verse and think, well, since there are no miracles today, then there's no power available to us today. Don't we? We've got three words for that. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. You say, well, that's the only one. I said it three times. That's three words. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You know what? The same power that can move a physical mountain can also move one that we would simply call figurative in a sense. Do you have mountains in your life? When you face the hard times, the struggles of life, don't we sometimes say that we're either on the mountaintop or we're down in the valley? If we're down in the valley, that means we're sad, we're hurting. And what does that mean? We need the mountain moved out of the way. Don't we? The same power that can move a physical mountain can move a figurative one as well. And you know what? It takes exactly the same amount of faith for that to happen. And Jesus said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed... You could tell that mountain to get up and move and it'd go. Now what is the point? I truly believe that the faith of many hasn't grown to the size of a mustard seed. We try to go through life, face everything on our own. When it gets really, 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 really bad, we call on God. 
We've waited a little long, haven't we? When it comes to that. Instead of praying for a miracle, maybe we just need to pray like the apostles prayed so long ago. The words that we find in Luke chapter 17 at verse number 5, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what the hard times that you're facing in your life are. I, I, I don't know these things. God does. And thankfully, God has the power to help us. Not only that this morning, but God's power is there when I'm faced with temptations. Have you ever heard anyone say, you know, I sure would, I'd like to become a Christian someday, but... I just really don't think I can live the life of a Christian. I don't think I can live right. You ever heard anybody say something like that? I've heard that several times in my lifetime. They're faced with temptations and they have a hard time turning away from those things. I want you to know this morning it's not easy to live the Christian life. Not easy. But I will add this, it's worth it. It's altogether worth it. Now, I want you to think about something with me. Again, you may want to open your Bible, this time to the book of Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter 7, this section of it if, at least, it is in relation to the law of Moses as opposed to the law of Christ. Okay, what we're about to read. And Paul makes a very pertinent observation in regard to himself that would be true to all of us today. As we begin reading there in verse number 18, the Bible says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for I have a desire to do what is right, not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Stop right there for a minute. That's Paul writing that. Could you put your name, could you sign it to what Paul just said and it be true for you? I could. I could sign it and it would be true. And I'm pretty sure it'd be true for most of us because you know what? Paul was a pretty determined guy, wasn't he? When he was against Christ, how determined was he? And when he became for Christ, how determined was he? And Paul says, you know what? I, I want to do what's right, but I have a problem with that. I keep on doing what's wrong. Verse 20, Now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who did it, but sin that dwells in me. He's explaining what it is. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil is, lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Could you say that of yourself as well? I want to do what's right. I end up doing what's wrong. And I come to understand that when I do that, that is wrong, I'm, I'm still bound to the devil. I'm still serving him, at least in that thing. So Paul says, wretched man that I am. Paul, you're my hero. Paul says, no, I'm a wretched man. Who will deliver me from this body of death. Under the Old Testament law, if you break one law, basically you've broken all of them. You're held accountable for all of them. So that's what Paul is really talking about in this, this passage. It's a good question, isn't it? Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? Paul doesn't leave us hanging. Verse 25, thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind and with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Who can deliver one from 
that sinful way of thinking. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me just say it this way. That's where the power begins to come in when temptations come our way. You know, just as God delivered us from the oppressive nature of the law of Moses, He's going to deliver us at times of being tempted and tested. How do I know that? Because this same apostle that wrote those words in Romans wrote these words in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has taken, overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation He will also provide the way of escape so that you might be able to endure it. With the testing, He's going to give us a way. The word escape used here means simply a way out, an egress. Uh, a way of which we can get out of a place of danger or difficulty. Now here's the question. Maybe you want to write it down. When I'm being tempted and tested, this is the question I need always to ask myself. Do I look for the door God has provided or do I march on through the door that the devil has opened? Do I look for the door that God has provided or do I just headlong march right on through the door that the devil has opened? Far too many march through the door that Satan has opened rather than looking for the one that God has provided. What we need to, is the power to say no. Yes is easy, isn't it? No, not so much. And yes, is only easy if we don't stop to count the cost. Wow. God's power is there for me in those days. You know, one of the simple definitions given by Merriam-Webster Dictionary, merriamwebster.com, of the word surrender is this. To give oneself up into the power of of another. Are we willing to give ourselves up into the power of God? Are we? You know, Paul asked three times, he tells us, that the Lord would remove His thorn in the flesh. Do you remember God's answer to him? My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. That's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, first part of verse number 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Oh, we left off the last part of that, didn't we? For my power is made perfect in weakness. Was God just going to say, well, you know, my grace is good for you. Or was God going to provide some power to help Paul get through it? Same kind of power we can have in our own life today. If you keep reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, go on to the latter part of verse number 9, Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's not talking about miraculous power in that passage. He's talking about getting through His thorn in the flesh. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Every one of us go through those things, don't we? Every one of us. And then Paul says, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Paul, would you get strong? Because I have the power of Christ 
that's helping me through. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 4, For He was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in Him, but in dealing with you, we will live with Him by the power of God. If I want to be a person who is living a life of power, who has to be in my life? And I have to acknowledge that, I have to recognize that, and I have to be willing to avail myself of that power. As we close this morning, the only person who even has a shot at being a, a, a person living a true life of power is a Christian. It's the only one. Are you a Christian this morning? If not, I encourage you to make your life right with God by putting Him on in baptism, letting His blood wash your sins away. And even more than that this morning, are you a Christian who needs to make some changes in your life so that you can live that life of power? We're here for you. We want to help you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation today, come right now as we stand now.
come to the time in our service that we gather around the table and give thanks for what Christ did for us when he was hung on the cross. If you would now bow with me as we give thanks for this bread. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your love and mercy and grace that you showed to us in the act that you gave your Son for us that we might have forgiveness of our sins and that we might someday live with you. And we thank you now that you have Set, a time, set aside a time in the worship that helps us carry our mind back to that scene. And now as we partake of this bread, which represents his body, we pray that we might partake of it in a manner be pleasing unto you. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Bear with me, please. Heavenly Father, thank you too for this cup of fruit of the vine. that represents your son's blood as he was shed on the cross that we through him and through it might also have forgiveness of our sins. May we partake of this as we should and we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. And now as a matter of convenience, let's give thanks for all of those temporal blessings that he's blessed us with. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the physical blessings and the temporal blessings that you've blessed us with and for the material blessings. For we know that we are blessed far beyond most people in this world. Help us to understand that these blessings are yours, all that we have. Help us to understand that we are to use them for you. And help us understand that we now have the opportunity and that we have the obligation to give a liberal portion of this back to you so that others might be able to enjoy the spiritual blessings that we do. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mark, for another powerful lesson. That was an awesome lesson. Thank you for that. Appreciate your study and preparation for that each week. Such great lessons. So thankful for that. Uh, again, if you are with us today, we're thankful that you're here. Uh, if you're visiting, we're thankful that you're here. We want you to stick around uh, for our Bible study hour right after the closing prayer. So, so make plans to do that. You're invited to, to stay with us, and uh, we'll study God's Word together for another hour or so. And so uh, make plans to do that. Um, make sure that you grab that bulletin uh, so you can keep up with the things that are going on. Uh, many in there that need our prayers, many that are not in there that need our prayers. So um, grab that bulletin. A few announcements. Make sure you keep the Almaro family in your prayers. Uh, also, the Kilgore family. Ronnie passed away yesterday morning. Uh, Ronnie Kilgore passed away yesterday morning. So if some of you may not know that. Uh, and those arrangements have not been made yet. So we'll be trying to get those out in a couple of days. Um, so be looking for that. 
Also, Gary Compton, he came through his surgery very well. He is uh, at UAB. He's been moved to a regular room, and now he's awaiting uh, he'll be awaiting some uh, another surgery, uh, another surgery, excuse me, for esophageal cancer. Uh, so he's awaiting on that, and uh, then he'll have some chemo following. But uh, he's doing very well at this time. So, uh, but continue, continue uh, to uh, keep them in your prayers as well, the Compton family. Um, any other announcements that need to be made, or announcements that I've not made? Uh, make plans to be back tonight. Uh, at 5 o'clock here at the building. We're going to be doing the Bible quiz tonight in Romans chapter 5, so make sure to study up for that. Uh, so uh, Romans chapter 5, and then also make plans to be back midweek Bible study at 6.30 on uh, Wednesday for our midweek Bible study. Make sure that uh, make plans to be here with us. Kelly will lead us in one song, and then Brother Ronnie Brown will close us in prayer. Bow with me, please. Dear God, we come to you this morning, dear Lord, just thanking you for another, another day of life. We know, dear Lord, that you are the only true constant in our lives today. We live in an ever-changing world, but you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forever. We ask you, dear Lord, all these problems we have, everything, seem like everything we do is never right. Uh, there's a problem with anything we do. Up is down, right is wrong, black is white. Calling someone by the wrong pronoun is met with ridicule and harassment and hatred. How, dear Lord, can we fix this? We know, dear, dear God, that we need to get more love in our hearts and our minds for you. And please, dear Lord, help our country, like Ben, ben said earlier, help our country to get back to a God-fearing country like it once was. We ask dear Lord, just to be with the many on the prayer list that's been mentioned, dear Lord, and be with uh, the Harbison family, dear Lord, and be with the Kilgore family. It's a difficult time they're going through. We ask, dear Lord, just to be with them and to watch over them. We, we ask, you, dear Lord, to forgive us of our sins, watch over us, lead us, and guide us. But above all, we thank you for your dear son who you sent to die for us so that we, we may spend eternity with you one day. Thank you again for all you do. In your Christ, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.